weeks, the clearest path forward has been to pass a straightforward, short-term funding extension. MAGA extremists have failed, bipartisanship has prevailed, and both parties have come together to avert a shutdown. It was a victory for the American people and a complete and total surrender by right-wing extremists. I'm sure every bet you had was government was going to shut down. I don't know how many times you're going to count us out. A government shutdown has been averted. Congress passed a clean stop gap spending bill with only hours to spare before the deadline. The funding keeps the government running through mid-November. The deal didn't come without possible consequences for House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. I do intend to file a motion to vacate against Speaker McCarthy this week. I think we need to this rip week. off the Band-Aid. I think we need to move on with new leadership that can be trustworthy. If somebody wants to make a motion against me, bring it. There has to be an adult in the room. I am going to govern with what is best for this country. I don't understand how long will it take to understand that. I went 15 rounds. And joining me now to discuss all of the unfolding political drama here in Washington is The Hill's congressional reporter, Michael Schnell. Michael, so good to see you. Definitely some drama over the weekend. Gates throwing a curveball into this, saying he's going to file this motion to vacate. Where do we go from here? So, look, Julia, the House reconvenes today. The first time the House floor opens in a, is at noon today. As soon as that time, Matt Gates can go on the House floor and bring motion to vacate against Kevin McCarthy. As you laid out right there, this is kicking off the official process to hold a vote on ousting him. So now the big question here will be, well, can he survive that, right? Uh, right now, there are about two Republicans who have signaled that they would support this motion. Of course, Matt Gates, and then Republican Congressman Eli Crane, a freshman from Arizona. So we're going to have to see uh, what the dynamics are once Gates brings it to the House floor, see where Democrats are on this, because they're a big factor. But yeah, it looks like this week we're going to see a motion to vacate brought against Speaker McCarthy. So what's the likelihood of of this eventually happening in terms of McCarthy actually ousted. I mean, I would argue that this past weekend was a political win for him, but he still has members like Gates who are out to get him. Yeah, it is a bit. That, so that's obviously the main question here. So uh, there are a couple dynamics. So once McCart once Gates brings the motion to vacate on the floor, it's very possible we could see A, either a motion to table, or we can see B, a motion to refer this to committee, which would essentially be a procedural vote shielding Congress, shielding the House from having to weigh in directly of whether or not Speaker McCarthy should continue to hold the gavel. Uh, so whether or not he's safe or not, I think that's the big question right now. As I mentioned, there are two Republicans who have signaled that they would support Support him if there are about five or six who would oust him. If there are about five or six who would vote to oust him, that's then when you get into the really interesting conversation, which is what will Democrats do? They are really uh, the, the the question here because if the Democrats vote with Republicans uh, with uh, votes to oust Kevin McCarthy, that could be enough to take the gavel away from him. If they vote to protect him, that would save him. A curveball here is they could potentially vote present, mm -hmm. which would just leave him on the sidelines and say, okay, this is the Republican thing to deal with. Republicans are going to have to deal with. So there are a lot of possibilities swirling around right here. I can tell you that's something I'm going to be asking all lawmakers this week. Yeah, absolutely. It's so interesting because Democrats uh, work against McCarthy so much, but they worked with him over this weekend. So we'll see how that dynamic unfolds. Michael, thank you so much for joining us on set today. Thanks for having me. And funding for Ukraine has bipartisan support, but it has become a major sticking point for some Republicans who want to see changes to the border security policy. President Biden warned House Leader McCarthy not to walk away from the deal they've already made. There's no excuse for another crisis. Consequently, I strongly urge my Republican friends in Congress not to wait. Don't waste time as you did all summer. Pass a year-long budget agreement. Honor the deal we made a few months ago. We have the strongest we have the strongest economy in the world today. The strongest economy in the world today. We have more to do. But we are the indispensable nation in the world, internationally and domestically, in terms of our economy. Let's act like it. 
The Hill's Brett Samuels joins me now with more of the negotiations between the White House and Congress to fund Ukraine. Brett, give us an update as to what's happening now that we've seen this legislation pass through. And it looks like we may be having some trouble getting Brett here. Um, I'm going to bring Michael back in just while we have her. Um, you know, Ukraine funding, definitely a sticking point for a lot of Republicans, uh, Republicans in the Senate, I should say, and particularly Democrats in both chambers. Where do you see this going in terms of it impacting future negotiations, in terms of appropriations bill and future legislation? The, the, the question of Ukraine funding in this, in this funding battle last month, in the month of September, was really fascinating. Because you remember the Senate was moving forward with a bipartisan continuing resolution that included about $6 billion in aid for Ukraine. Yeah. That was just a fraction action of the $24 billion that the White House requested in its supplemental. And you had both Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Minority Leader Mitch McConnell firmly behind the fact that they needed Ukraine funding. The thing is that that was a big sticking point among House Republicans. This issue of support for Ukraine has really become a hot button issue in the House GOP conference. And a number of Republicans have called for curtailing support for Ukraine. Yeah. At the end of the day, Kevin McCarthy recognized that with the deadline looming and coming upon Republican uh, on Congress, the fact that House Republicans were largely going to take the blame for a shutdown, he decided it was in the best interest to put this clean CR on the floor, notably without Ukraine funding, because that could have, you, if the Ukraine funding was in there, you could have seen the Republican opposition skyrocket. Yeah. Democrats and a number of Republicans were not happy with the lack of Ukraine funding. They've said it's important to continue to support for Kyiv, especially, I'll note, Volodymyr Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, mm -hmm. was in the Capitol meeting with lawmakers yeah. in the month of September. So, look, House Democratic leaders put out a statement over the weekend saying it's their understanding that Speaker McCarthy will put a bill on the floor for support for Ukraine, an up and down vote soon. So, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have to see how that plays out. But really fascinating dynamics that of everything for, for government funding, it came down to Ukraine. Yeah, definitely interesting dynamics within the Republican Party not being united on Ukraine. Our friend Brett is back. And, Brett, we know that on the Democratic side of the aisle and the White House, it's a very different situation. So, when it comes to Ukraine, this is something the Biden administration appears unwilling to waver on. Definitely. Yeah, it's great to see you guys. Um, but yeah, this is something that the White House has been very adamant that Ukraine funding is something that they are not going to take off the table. It's not something that they are going to let just kind of slide by just so that they can get the votes to, to pass something in terms of a funding bill. We saw President Biden in the immediate aftermath of uh, the passage of this temporary measure, uh, both in terms of a statement that he put out and then uh, a little speech that he gave from the White House on Sunday. Uh, in both of those, he was very focused on Ukraine funding, very adamant that Ukraine funding would not be taken off the table. Uh, and so this is something I think that is going to continue to be uh, a big talking point for the White House and a big sticking point in talks moving forward. Right, right. And another um, thing plaguing the White House right now is the border. We saw that border numbers continue to skyrocket with migrants flooding over the southern border last week. Lots of pictures that have been very difficult, I think, for both uh, Republicans and Democrats to watch. How much pressure is the Biden administration under to take a stronger stance on this? Yeah, it's something that I think, you know, obviously we've seen Republicans have been very adamant that the border is going to be a sticking point for them. It's something that we've seen Republicans in the primary debates have sort of hammered the Biden administration over the border. Uh, the, the White House in sort of their initial supplemental funding request that they put out uh, earlier this summer, you know, they included some money for border security as sort of, uh, I think, an olive branch to Republicans in Congress to say, hey, you know, we're willing to to spend more money on border security and border enforcement and, and agents at the border and all that. Um, but I think it's something that uh, the White House is continuing to take fire on. Uh, so I think it's clearly a political vulnerability for them. Uh, so the question is, you know, how far are they willing to go uh, in terms of providing additional funding, providing additional resources? Because I think uh, what what Republicans in Congress are willing to do and then what the White House is willing to do on their end, uh, there's certainly a gap there. So we'll see where we end up as, as talks heat up.
Going to switch gears here, former President Trump um, in his business fr uh, fraud trial begins today in New York. Trump is, uh, is expected to be in court today. A judge ruled last week that Trump, his sons, and Trump organization executives intentionally def defrauded banks and insurance companies by inflating and deflating the value of their assets by at least 2.2% billion dollars. The ruling stripped Mr. Trump of his business licenses in the state. It also raised the potential for him to lose some control over additional properties in New York. Brett, will Trump take some of the will take Trump take the witness stand during the trial? You know, I think this is something that we've seen him talk about. Uh, he's willing to testify, whether it be in one of his multiple federal trials or his civil cases, he, he likes to say that he's going to testify. Uh, I think I'd be surprised and, and folks would be surprised if we saw him take the witness stand in this particular case. Uh, I would be surprised if his lawyers uh, advised him to do that, just given the former president's uh, tendency to embellish or mislead. Uh, that would certainly be a problem in the courtroom. But uh, he did arrive uh, at the courthouse this morning in Manhattan. So he's there in person. He's there to watch it play out. Uh, and it's something that he will continue to talk about. He clearly views it as a political asset uh, that he can continue to, to frame himself as a victim of these investigations and of these trials. Um, so certainly I would expect uh, Donald Trump to continue to speak out about, about his legal woes in these trials, even if he is not on the witness stand during them. And do you think he's viewing this particular court appearance like he has viewed these past arraignments and appearances as essentially a campaign stop for him? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I think I think so. You know, he clearly believes that, you know, all the coverage that he gets. We saw, you know, CNN this morning was was airing a live shot of his motorcade through New York City. Uh, he's able to give comments from the courthouse that get covered. Um, you know, it just sucks up all the oxygen and all the focus is on what is Donald Trump up to in court today and not on what some of his rivals in the primary are doing. So, uh, you know, while it is certainly not good for his business and for his sort of uh, personal legal issues, uh, I think the former president and his team clearly see that there are, um, you know, political benefits to this uh, and that he, as you said, can essentially turn these court appearances into campaign stops. It's really a campaign like no other, this GOP primary, and I'm sure the 2024 general election will be the same. Thanks so much for joining us, Brett, and thank you so much Thanks for joining for us. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill wherever you get your news so you never miss an update.